So today we're dealing with stress concentrations. Now, we don't want to step away from what we already know. We already know how to calculate forces, internal and external forces. We know about equilibrium. We know about axial stress, P over A. We also learned about strain, deflection over original length. And we've spent a good deal of time on the stress strain diagram. And hopefully you've recognized what a powerful set of information is available from a stress strain diagram. Okay. With all that said, now we're ready to go a step deeper into this idea of stress concentrations. So we're gonna start off by stepping back to what we saw in our first lecture. If we have an axial load on a member, our stress is P over A. What this means is we can take a section cut, we can calculate the force on the member and the force that is acting on the section. Now, one thing we haven't stressed is we've got this force. We talked a little bit about when we talked about tensors and we didn't talk a lot about the direction of load. What we're basically saying is the load is perpendicular to the area. You guys got that idea? Perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. Now, that doesn't cover everything because in another, what, next lecture, we're gonna learn about shear when the load is parallel to the area. And that's gonna give us our two major ways we're gonna evaluate load. Either it's gonna be, or stresses, they're either gonna be perpendicular to the area or parallel to the area. We have allowables for perpendicular, that's our FTU, FCU. And we also have allowables for parallel, that's FSU, our shear allowable. If we have torsion, we're gonna to be dealing with that in another lecture or so after that we'll find that that's just a parallel stress, which means it's a shear stress. When we deal with bending, we're gonna find out that causes normal stresses, which are just perpendicular stresses. So that idea of being able to resolve the force into components that are perpendicular and parallel is critical. Got that? So what we're dealing with here is a force and no matter what cross section we cut, the perpendicular, the force is perpendicular. It acts on that area. And when we calculate P over A stresses, we're calculating what kind of stress? Average, Average. stress. That means the force at any point in the section is that average stress. Excuse me, the stress is that average stress. And all points in the section is that average stress. You got that? That is a gross simplification that is usually applied without thinking to most structural analysis in industry. Okay, so we got that idea. No matter where we cut it, we cut at the top, we cut at the middle, we cut at the bottom, we got the same stress, P over A. Got it? Okay. And that's what we see here. We see this little, we see kind of through the part onto a perpendicular area that's been cut. And then we see the stress that occurs, that average stress on that. Now, if we really looked at it more closely, instead of just applying our formula, if we actually had the force applied as shown here, we could see that there's a little infinitesimal area. And that if we actually grab the force, like let's say we have our little fingers and we grab the force, a little point on the thing, we get a hold of it and we start yanking on it. We can see that the stress in that little elemental area is nearly infinite, right? It's nearly infinite because the area is like near zero. And then if we grabbed a little more, it's a little bit less than infinite. So what we end up seeing is what this actually wants to do. It wants to go into this weird shape that looks like this. You see how that works? So we can kind of see that actually the stress right under here is like infinite. The stress out a little further is a little less. The stress out here is a little less. And the stress out here at the outer edge is like nearly zero. 
but the average stress is P over A. Now, if we move down a little bit, if we say, okay, well, we're grabbing it up here at the top, but if we took a cross section down in here, you'd see that actually by the time we get down there, the load spreads out a little bit and it's a little softer. Now we've got a little more stress on the edges and a little less peaking in the middle. If we grab it way down here, we find out that the peaking is basically gone and we have nearly an average stress like what we're calculating. And if we continue to approach the other side, we're gonna end up with that same peak stress distribution, okay? St. Venant's principle is what deals with this idea of the proximity to load. And most of the stresses we're going to calculate in 3261 and even 3271 will be assuming the St. Venant's principle is true and that we're far enough away from the load that we actually can ignore all of those effects. You got that? There's one other thing I was going to say about this. Okay. Oh, I, I remember. So what we're going to do, so basically when we do this P over A, and we're going to do a lot of that, we're basically taking an average stress. Sometimes that ain't going to be as sufficient. We'll talk about that case. One other comment. You might ask yourself, so how far away do we need? Like if this is the very top and this is the bottom, this is some length, how far away? And let's say this is some width, and this is the same width in this direction, how far away before our stresses actually become this? Well, one rule of thumb, which is a, a gross approximation, is to say, well, if you take one diameter, or actually the width of the part, and move down about a diameter down, is about where, is shear, it's called shear lag, and what happens is, if we put, it's kind of like, a, imagine a, a sheet, right? And if we pull on a sheet and we grab it with our little fingers here and we pull it, it's going to do this, right? And basically, if we're pulling on this point here, we can see that the load kind of fans out like this. It's called shear lag. You won't see this again really until graduate work. But basically, you can imagine all this. This is unloaded and this slowly picks up load. But by the time you get out here, it's basically at full, the full average. You see how that works? So just learning to just say, oh, where's this load applied? It's applied here, and we'll just span that out at basically roughly 45 degrees. That's a really good principle if you want to start looking more detailed at the stresses inside parts. Right now, we're kind of not quite ready to do all that, but we need to understand when we do this P over A, this is a gross approximation. It's actually an average stress. Sometimes we'll call that average stress the gross stress. Sometimes we'll call it the far field stress. For example, Let's say we have a fuselage and we have a, a skin, right? There's a lot of stress in the skin. And if we say there may be a little hole back in here that we want to evaluate, and if we evaluated the stress as the actual stress on the fuselage, we might grab that stress. We'd call it the far field stress because it doesn't, we're not changing it based on whatever feature we found like this hole, okay? So this idea of average has the idea that the load had just spread out. The, uh, the idea of a gross area means we're not taking into account any proximity to the load or any changes in the cross section. The idea of far field stress is one that basically says if we have a big structure, we're saying the stress if we're not accounting for any little features. So with those basic ideas, we're maybe ready to take another little step forward. Are you still with me? Okay. So then if we draw this out then, this little axial member, we can see if we're near the load as we are in this little picture, picture A or picture B, we have this load applied. Now this is a compression load. We're gonna expect that if we're a little ways away from the ends, that we're gonna have some significant peaking. But if we're far enough away from the ends, we're gonna have basically a P over A. So this is this is more than P over A, right? This little thing here is more than P over A and out here is less than P over A, over A. true that? Because we would have to sum it all up to get that average stress P over A, okay? 
Now, if we actually wanted to say, well, what is the real stress distribution? Now we're gonna learn some simplifications like just P over A and the shear P over A and bending MC over I eventually. But if we wanted to get fancy, we'd have to go into the theory of elasticity and actually it gets really complicated. You guys, how many guys at some point in your life you enjoyed math? How many guys found out you started to hate math when you got to a certain point in calculus? Right about the time you started thinking, I'm gonna like math, I'm gonna like calculus, and then they they went nuts. And we thought, this is not fun, right? Now, engineers tend to make gross simplifications to keep it simple, and that's what we're gonna do to, you know what we're gonna do? You know the easiest way to account for stress concentration? The easiest. How many guys love this word? Easiest. How many guys want to know if I were to tell you the secret, the easiest way to make money? The easiest way to marry a beautiful wife or husband? The easiest way to be happy for the rest of your life? The easiest way to be successful in your career? The easiest way to ma master, ma master? Master this class. Easiest is good. Here's what we're going to do. You know what we're going to do? We're going to calculate P over A, looks like an average stress, and multiply it by K. Woohoo! It don't get any easier than that. You with me? We're going to call this case a T. How many guys know two people with the same name? Let's say John, you walk into a party. You say, John, 15 heads turn. You go, crap, right? So you gotta be a little more specific. Well, same things here. Do we use K for anything in aerospace, in engineering? Yes, oh my gosh. K is so common. So you need to be careful when we say K, what K are we talking about? In this case, what are we talking about? Stress, concentration, factor. Bang, got it? And what we're gonna do is we're often, not always, often gonna put a little subscript T on there. Now that's not meaning tension, although it could. That means theoretical. And the reason we use that subscript T theoretical is because it's not necessarily real either. <laughs> it's another gross approximation, okay? All right, so that's what we're gonna do. If you guys can calculate P over A stresses, then all you need to be able to do is be able to apply that factor to get the max stress. So if we have this load, the stress is just P over A, okay? And if we had a feature that caused stresses to peak up, we could calculate the stress concentration factor associated with that, multiply it by our average stress, and that will give us the max stress. This is the idea of how we're going to apply stress concentration factors most of the time. You got that? Okay, if you want to fall asleep the rest of the lecture, then you can. No, don't do that. <laughs> That's the main thing we're going to learn. And now we're going to put meat and potatoes on that basic structure of nutrition. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else do I want to say here? Okay, another comment. We've been talking about the proximity of the load, of the point to the load when we're talking about stresses. But actually, when we deal with stress concentration, there's a lot more things to it. And before we even go on to the next slide, let me walk us through some of that real quick. Usually, when we deal with stress concentration factors, what we're dealing with is a feature. Okay? So let's say we have a rod. Let's say it's a little rod like this, a little thin plate, and we put a force on it. If we calculate the stress, let's just sketch in what a typical cross section looks like. Our stress is just P over A. And that actually, except for near the point of application of the loads, that's roughly the stress you're gonna see, okay? 
The only place that's approximate is right at the ends. And if you grab the, the ends with like grips, right? You take the end of that puppy and you grab it like this, you're pulling it, not just from a little point, but from all the way around it, then actually that's pretty valid from end to end, right? See that? Okay. However, and, and actually we could, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but we can imagine, we talked about running load in the first lecture, or actually I made you watch the video because I went over, I talked too much basics, right? You can imagine the force lines. If this thing is, say, 10 inches wide, and this is 100 pounds, and that would be, uh, what, 10 pounds per inch? You could just imagine the little force lines running through this part like this. They're undisturbed. They're all going in a straight line. How many guys have ever taken the 605 freeway, the 5 freeway gun all the way to, like, up to the north, right? In some places, the freeway's wide. And you're all going at the same speed. Yeah, good luck. And you're all staying in your lanes. If you're all moving as fast as you need to go, then there's no reason to change lanes unless something happens, right? But what happens if somebody over here is broke down? Does everybody stop and move over evenly so all the traffic continue to go to same speed, a little slower, but the same? No. These people have to stop because these people ain't stopping. They just keep on going. So what ends up happening, these people's speed is nearly unchanged over in the leftmost lane. These people in the middle get a little bit slowed down because of people trying to dodge around. And the people right here are basically dead stop. You see that picture? So if we imagine that these lines are all nice and clean with nothing here, we could take this or spread it evenly and just imagine no matter where we take a little element, our stress is P over A. However, that same bar, if there is a feature, like let's say there's a hole here, what happens is now these ones out here only get interrupted a little bit. These ones in here get interrupted completely. And these ones that were running right through here get interrupted a good deal. So what happens is, if we look at this, at this end and this end, what was the average stress? P over A, okay? But when we get in here, what is the average stress now? It's P over A net. If we take a cross section through here, our area is now the width times the thickness minus the hole diameter times the thickness. That's our net area and the average stress through the feature is more. You got that? It's still an average stress, but it's the net stress. Because the cross section is reduced, our net stress goes up. So if the stress here was a nice even value like this, the stress here will be a much higher value just, and that's still using an average stress distribution. Can you see that? However, if you picture those people parked on the right lane of the freeway, the people stop behind them trying to get left. The people in the next lane that have to slow down to keep from getting nailed and so on, you can see that what's going to happen is, let me draw redraw part of this. If we draw this through that feature, you can see that actually we're going to get this is an increase in stress from the old one. And then it's going to peak up and right along the edge of the hole, it's going to be much higher. The new average stress is actually right here near the middle. That's the net stress, P over A net. But the peak stress here is going to be more than that. And the stress out here at the extreme fiber is going to be a little less than that net stress. Do you see that? So actually, if we had a table or an equation that could give us for a typical bar with a hole, what stress concentration factor do we expect to find? We can imagine that will be a function of the total width and the total diameter and the thickness might even come to play. If we have a bar 
with the hole in the middle, that will probably have a different K than if we have a bar with a hole off to one side. Because now our distribute our net stress is going to be a function of the diameter. But now you can see because of the offset, that's going to have a different distribution and a different case of T than a central hole. You see that. Okay, with this said, actually all we need are some figures or some equations which give us different parts. What do they look like? And for the given geometry, how do we calculate k sub t? We then can calculate the net stress and multiply it by k sub t to get the max stress. And we usually don't care about the whole stress distribution. All we really care is about the max stress because we're trying to evaluate if the part will fail. Now, if you find out that one of the students in your class failed, you probably wouldn't care very much. But if you found out that a family member of yours died, you would care. It don't matter if it wasn't you. In the same way, if our structure fails anyway, we care. So all we need to do is figure out the biggest threat, the largest stress, the F max, and evaluate against the allowables, which in this case would be F to U. Got it? Okay. You guys are well armed with the basic principles to continue. So when we're dealing with stress concentrations, what we're going to have to be able to do is calculate the average stress at the net section which means we take a look at our part, we look from top to bottom, and we find out what area do we need. For this part here on the, le on the left, how many areas do we need to evaluate that part? This part here. How many areas do we need to calculate to evaluate that? One. Just one. Just one. Just one. What if there's a hole that goes through here? Now we'd have two, right? We'd have to take a cross section through here. It looks like this, right? And then we take one out through here. Probably the one through this part is, is critical. What if we had a part that looks like this? You would need three. One, areas. two, three. And we're generally gonna ignore this one, the big one, right? One through this feature, one through this feature, one through this feature, and then one that's here. This would be the P over A total stress. This is P, this is using the A net through this hole. This is using the A net through that feature, and this is using the A net through that feature. Four stresses. All we need to do is evaluate the max, but we might not spot which is the max. Now, if we have something with three holes, it's pretty easy to figure out, well, that's our net stress that's going to matter the most, right? F net through this section is the critical one. But if we have a, a notch and a half notch and this, we might not know. We might have to calculate all three. And then when you recognize that each of these have a different case of T, so this has a lower, this has a lower net stress, but it might have a higher stress concentration factor. We don't know yet. So we'd have to calculate the net stress through here, here, and here, calculate the stress concentration factor of feature one, two, and three, and then multiply this net by that feature, that, and so on, and then check whichever one gives us the highest stress against our allowable. You got it? Sometimes we'll end up switching failure modes. If we end up getting shear, we might have to check against shear. We might have a different allowable. But for current analysis, where we're at in this lecture, we're just dealing with tension. It's always going to be up to you or FC. Okay, so that is the basic principles that we're headed for. So we're dealing with stress concentration factor. We're gonna need, need to be able to quickly spot where is the net stress critical? What is the stress concentration factor appropriate? And therefore, what is the max stress once I've accounted for everything that might be critical on the part? The idea of stress concentration, once again, we're not usually dealing with a proximity like we started out talking St. Venance principle. What we usually are dealing with in engineering when we're dealing with stress concentration is we have a, a, a structure that has some feature like a notch or a change in area or a hole or something like that that we're accounting for with that K. 
you calculate the net stress through the feature, multiply by the K. Now, one caveat, usually we're using the net stress, but in sometimes we're using a different stress than the net. For example, remember that hole where I said the, the hole was not in the middle, but offset? What we will do in that case, we'll use what's called the nominal stress. And that already is a peaked value that accounts for just Instead of just a net stress through here, we're already getting some redistribution of load without even accounting for peaking. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to, to figure out whether we need the nominal or the net, but usually it's the net unless you have a weird looking feature. You guys with me? Okay, so you guys should now understand uh, our basic approach for evaluating net stresses and max stresses using stress concentration factors. You don't yet have the meat and potatoes of how we're actually going to do it or what curves we're going to use yet, but you basically are armed with the basic ideas that you're going to need to be great at this subsection of the material. So let's talk about net stress a little more, okay? In a the second? First, yes? I think there's a question. Oh, or someone has a hand raised. What is the question? For us to uh, choose the biggest threat, would we just go for the, the cross section that has the least material or something like that? Usually. Usually oh. that's a safe bet. That's what's done most of the time in industry. Now, you can, as you get more judgment, your judgment will matter, right? So what happens is, you know, we all have judgment. We all think it should be a certain way. And when our judgment is good, we can nail it without a lot of work. When our judgment is bad or immature, we sometimes get it wrong more often than right. And if we ever are, are if we're still developing our judgment, sometimes it's better to take more section cuts, evaluate more places to validate your judgment. So basically what we're saying is if you have, as you develop judgment, usually you're right, you'll grab the minimum section. However, there are times when you may not be sure and you may have to calculate these max stresses, the net and max stresses in different places, and then take the one that's the most critical, we say. Okay. All right. So if you look here, here's a set of cross sections. All of these, it's easy to calculate the net area, the area, because you just take this times this plus this times this plus this times this, and you try not to double count anything and you try not to leave anything out. True that. So in this case, we have a strut, a force, and, and at this point, we're gonna imagine the force is applied to the centroid because we don't know what to do if it doesn't, okay? So it's just P over A for all of these. And the A is just the area, okay. Now we get to these guys, and you'll notice each of these has a hole. So now we need to talk about the net area. We actually have the gross area of the part, which is the one above. And we have the net area, which is a cut. Actually, both of them areas are just cuts at different places. We cut the part where there's no feature, it's the gross area, what I call the gross area, or the far field area. And if you cut it right through the feature, through the hole, there's a different area, we call that the net area, you got that? So basically for all these, you see how easy this is? How many holes do we cut out here in the A? One, and what's the area, Francisco? The area is DT. Okay, you guys got that? How many, how many holes do we take out in part in this one? One hole, one hole, one hole. Dose holes. Here's St. Finan's principle. St. Finan's principle says, if you're far enough away from the force application, then the stress is basically the average stress. And if you ain't, it taint, okay? So we see this in the vicinity of the load, we see we got a lot more deflection and deflection correlates to strain and strain correlates to stress. You can see that this in the middle has more higher stress than out here, doesn't it? Especially near the ends. But when you get near the middle, it's probably about the average, see that? This is the distribution near the ends and near the middle, it's more like this. Now, if we had had a big plate like this applied, 
Then it's going to load this up nice and evenly. You're actually just going to have the average stress everywhere. Or like imagine a big old post sitting on dirt, right? The Sybils deal with this all the time because dirt's really crushable. It doesn't look like it is, but it is. So it's really important to understand these principles. Okay. If we look here, once again, near the ends, we're going to have a distribution of stress like this. Somewhere out here, it's going to be a little better. And then somewhere, once we get far enough away, it's going to be this, and it's going to continue like this till it gets near another load. You guys starting to get this? I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Hallelujah. Perfect. Okay. Next idea. Whoops. Did we skip something? No. Okay. Force lines. We talked about force lines a little bit. If we're far away from a feature, in this case, what is our feature? It's these notches. If we're up here, we can see all the little force lines. Imagine these are the lanes on the freeway, and your GPS is telling you there's a problem ahead, right? These people. Now, if this is now this is actually a little bit hard to see. Let's imagine this a little differently. Let's say it actually looks like this. Because if it's this narrow, it's harder to see. Let's say we got this many lines of traffic, right? These people, if they were going 70 miles an hour here, they're going to still be going 70 miles an hour. They don't care. Have you noticed that people, even otherwise very nice people, when they get on the freeway in a car, it's like they become animals. They don't care about anybody. There's somebody standing here and they fly by. If you haven't experienced this, go to New York. Stand on the edge of the curve. Find out how fast the cars go past you within inches. Now, these people are going to have to nearly stop, right? Or they're going to have to get real aggressive, which means we're going to have all these cars bunched up here and some of them stopped in here trying to get out. And then this speed is basically still 70 miles an hour. This speed in here is somebody, maybe it's 50 miles an hour. And over here, it's like 20 miles an hour. If we look here, our average stress was 70 miles an hour, if that made any sense. And over here, but if you look here, the, now if you do a net section through here and just calculate the change in area, you could say, well, the average stress, P over A, it's higher. It's higher because actually we have the same number of cars in a smaller width, which means we have a higher intensity of cars through here. And the average intensity is just P over A net, where net is just the area through here, which just means the total width minus these two notches, right? You with me? So what we're going to do is we're going to count the net stress, calculate the net stress. This is just, this is F net is just P over A net. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look up this feature. We're going to get a K sub T to that feature. We'll multiply it by this and that will give us the max stress. And what that means is here, we're going to get a much higher stress. In here, we're going to get a lower stress. The overall average is more than it was, right? In here, it's a little lower than the average. Out here, it's a lot more than the average. This value here is KT F net. That's our max stress. And in here, it's lower than the average, but who cares what it is? Because it ain't critical. So we calculate our A net, we calculate our F net, and we calculate our F max. Got it? Okay. We're actually not going to do anything with the stress, the force lines. It's just helping us to visualize this principle. Okay. And actually, so this is this is what we just drew, right? We see the average stress is this average here. The the in the middle here, it's going to have something less than the average. And out here at the extreme fiber, it's going to be the max, which is KT times P over. And what little subscript should we have on that A right there in that equation that I didn't draw for some reason? Net. Uh, net. A net. Do I have to write net there to know that that should be a net area? No. No. Because you guys are going to look at uh, this better be the area corresponding to where I took the section check, which we could just call the area. But we often give it the fancy name A net. Got it? Okay. And here's our basic approach. Look at this. You guys can go back to sleep. This is the last thing we're going to learn. No, we're going to keep, actually, that's true, but we're going to keep 
putting meat and potatoes on this. You guys nail it. I still am hoping for the day when you all ace my class. And I don't feel embarrassed that I made it too easy. I think, ooh, that was a hard class. And every single student nailed it. When they get an industry, they're going to do amazing things. Anyone there? Okay. What does the T stand for? Theoretical. Theoretical point. Going to go to Victor on that one. I, he was close to the first one. Okay. All right. One more. I keep promising you one thing and doing something else. Okay. Another thing we're going to learn <laughs> is a basic principle. And this is everything that we do with stress conscious. Remember, we use that little subscript T, theoretical. The place where that's valid is if our stresses are down in the elastic range. Okay. Because what it basically assumes is it assumes that all the stresses are acting. Remember our stress drain curve? And E, the modulus, is valid down here below the yield. That's where our E is valid. And we calculate the remember stresses related to flexion. Remember when I we put that load on, we showed that deflected shape. Let me do that again. Let's say if we have a force acting on this guy like this, you can see the deflected shape is going to be something like this, right? More deflection, higher stress, less deflection, lesser stress. True that when we're close to the loading. But by the time we get down here, the deflection is going to be basically even. That's why it's an average stress. This is assuming that the only thing affecting the stress distribution is proximity to the load and the instantaneous area. What it doesn't account for, but if, if this stress here is like, let's say that we have a typical uh, aluminum extrusion that goes to 80 KSI. This is somewhere around 65 KSI. If our stresses are down in this range, down in here, then this stress might be 10 KSI. This stress up here might be 40 KSI. Both of these are well below the yield. That means the E is the same. That means they're pulling on the same stiffness, which means the only thing affecting the stress distribution is the geometry. But if we pull this, to say 60 KSI and our stress concentration factor is three, that means how much max stress do we have? Three times 60, that's 120 KSI. That's way above FTU, that couldn't even get there. What happens is we go up here and our modulus, that means the modulus here in the middle where the stresses are high is, what's the modulus right here? What's the E when we get up here at the ultimate? What's the zero. slope of that? It's zero. If the modulus is zero here, that's going to move with like negligible load. And out here, it still might be the original modulus of like 10 million. So what that means is it's like having somebody really weak here and somebody really strong here. So what happens is where maybe our stress distribution wanted to do this, but because this part is so much softer, it means and this out here is stiffer. That means this carries more load and you only get a little bit of peak like this. You see that? If the modulus is not constant. So if our stresses are low, then KT is valid. If our stresses are high, KT is probably not valid. It's only valid for low stresses. However, a lot of people in industry just apply it like there's no tomorrow without thinking because it's easier not to think than to think. How many guys ever noticed that? Have you ever thought really deep and it's super fun because you're figuring out the mysteries of the universe and after a while, your mind is so tired, you just don't even want to think about anything? You with me? Okay. So looking at our little picture here, here we have a little force. You guys are now saying, oh yeah, look, the max stress is going to be F net, right? Which is P over A net. That's the average stress. That's this over here, isn't it? 
if we look, so let's just imagine that we have this, and let's say we take a really tiny force, like one pound. Let me clean this up. Let's say we apply a force of like a uh, hundred pounds. If we have a hundred pounds on this part, let's say that that gives us a stress of say, uh, oh, 20 KSI, okay? If we have 20 KSI and our, and let's say in a typical hole, I'm gonna tell you a typical hole under a uniaxial load, our KT is usually about three, 3.0. So if we, let's say this is 10 KSI. If we calculate 10 KSI, what's our max stress? If this is our net stress? 30. 30 KSI. If our material has an FTU of 80 KSI and an FTY of let's say 60 KSI, is that linear or nonlinear? Linear. So linear. Does, this K, does the K, is the KT valid for that? Yes. 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 So that means we're gonna have 10 KSI with a max stress of 30 KSI. That means out here it's a little less than 10, out here it's, it's 30. And this averages out, averages out to P over A net. Right? P over A net is the average stress. The max stress is 30 times that value. I mean, three times that value. And the minimum stress is some lesser value, who cares? Got it? Okay. Now, let's say I put on more load, and let's say I now have a 25 KSI. 25 KSI is the net stress I calculate. What is our max stress now? 75. Do we expect that to be a real stress? No. No, now a lot of times we'll just use it. If we can show positive margin, we check that against FTU, shows positive margin. We just run to the bank. We just keep moving because it's conservative. But what's going to happen is once you get up above about 60 KSI on that stress strain diagram, your modulus drops, which is going to have the effect of softening the peak. It wanted to go out here, but it can't. So what that means is this is not quite 75, and this is a little more than it would have been if it had been linear. Is that because of like when it plastically deforms, it's just like that section gets a little bit stronger and it kind of like not handles stronger, the stress better? Not stronger. This guy here is less stiff than this little strip right here, right? Okay. Like let's say I grab Frida's arm and I grab Francisco's arm. And let's say that Francisco is more ornery and stubborn. So when I pull on them with the same force, uh, she moves a little more than he does. Now, if I pull for low load, they both resist me the same. But when I pull more, Frida starts to get, because she hasn't spent as much time on the bench press. <laughs> so she gives a little more, and now he's carrying more of the load. Now, if I pulled low load, Maybe she would have, if she was near the feature, she would have responded a certain way. But under higher load, she's past her ability, so she can't peek up to what that theoretical thing says she should have gone to. And now he ends up carrying a little more. You see that? Stiffer piece carries more, even if it's further away. It's kind of like Red Rover, Red Rover, you're all bound together. And the first person gets obliterated because the stress was, so, you know, the low load, they all take it together. But if they get obliterated, you know, this person holds more than that. And the stronger that person is, the more they can help. But if they're further away, they can't help so much. But the more this person deflects, the more the third and fourth and fifth people, if they're strong enough, can actually assist. Okay. And actually, when we talk about strong enough, what we really are saying is stiff enough. Because if we fail anywhere, we're calling it fail. So we're not talking about failure. We're talking about stiffness and motion and how that relates. If we actually got to a really high stress near where, where all the stress in the cross section is near the allowable, because of the softness of the modulus, we would actually get to a uniform stress distribution that looks just like what? 
Or average. net or average stress? Half stinking net. Half average. Yes. Point, Mr. Brown. Got it? So, when we do KT, what we're really saying is our stresses are down below yield. If we ever use it for anything else, it's conservative. What does it mean to be conservative? It means it's pretending that it's worse than it really is. And this is a really good approach if you can use that and keep it simple. But you need to also recognize that this is a gross approximation. It's less true. KT is really valid when your stresses are low. They're not dresses valid. It's not so valid when the stresses are high. So then the question becomes, well, actually, can you can your material strain that much? You're going to get all kinds of deformation within the material to get this kind of permanent deformation to get this. But if we're dealing with ultimate loads, which means we've got ultimate loads, which are way more, you take the max loads that can never happen, you multiply by 1.5, which can really never happen, and then you're doing all your analysis. Even You don't care if the part is destroyed afterwards. You just want it to sustain it. This is how we do ultimate analysis. We figure, hey, on an a ultimate kind of event, what we want to make sure is that the structure survives so that people have a chance. That's like extreme cases, not like daily operation kind of thing. Right. And that's where 70 or more percent of the analysis in the industry is done for that case. It keeps it simple. And there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, when we start talking about what really happens, then we're going to go to the yield level. Usually then we're dealing with fatigue and damage tolerance. And I'm going to give you an introduction to those two topics in 3271. After you've taken this class three times. Hopefully not. Right? Okay. You guys still with me? You got those ideas? So this, we're actually not going to do anything with this other than understanding conceptually that if our stresses are above the yield, then what does that mean? And KT, ignore that, KT. KT is conservative. Yeah. So you guys said? You two can put two points on your own work. Okay. All right, that's basically everything we're gonna do. Now let's find out how do we get stress concentration factors? Okay, you're gonna go to Appendix C. Why Appendix C? Because C starts with concentration. Appendix concentration, you can remember right where to go, right? I wanted to make your materials Appendix M, but then everybody be confused. Why is there an Appendix B and then an Appendix M right afterwards? Okay, so that's just a different one. Appendix C is stress concentration factors, great. Okay, here's the first one. You're going to find this case. This is an infinite plate. What does that mean, infinite plate? It means bigger than really easily measurable dimensions. So if I give you a part that is, say, four by five, is that infinite? No, that's not infinite. But let's say we have a fuselage and there's a hole in the fuselage. Oh, yeah, you could say, oh. What's the stress right here near the hole? And we could just pretend that's an infinite plate. You see how that works? Okay. If we have it, okay. Now you'll notice there's a lot of things. Look, we got biaxial load. We haven't really done a lot with it. Look, we can talk about pulling in this direction, right? That's going to give us a stress in that direction. We can pull about pull in this direction. That's going to give us a stress in that. This is sigma in one direction. This is sigma in another direction. True that. And these are equal and opposite. You still with me? Okay. So let's make this simple. Let's say, you'll notice there's actually three cases over here, and you guys need to be able to, you know how fat, you shouldn't have to take five, 10 minutes on this. You should be able to spot this immediately in seconds. You say, oh, I got a hole. Yeah, I don't have any convenient dimensions. That means it's probably like an infinite plate. And so I got three different cases. Let's talk about what they are. Let's say we have a hole in semi semi infinite plate and let's say we have a force like this which of these cases do we use unilateral stress right one of the stresses is zero what's our stress concentration factor it's 3 it's 3 now this is shown weird usually what we're going to do is see kt equals 3.0 the way this shows that i followed the reference it's shown that the max stress is three times that. What this means is at this point here, if sigma one is what we're dealing with, 
then the stress right here, right? That's where it peaks up and that's three times the value. The stress right in here, remember that's right in the lee where it's like negligible. What happens is if you imagine this hole and it's being pulled this way, you can see how, see how this thing is collapsing. The hole collapses. If we're pulling that direction, it collapses. That means you're getting a compression. That's what this is saying. You're basically going to get whatever that normal stress was, you're going to get that much stress in the other direction. If you look at a little element right here, it's actually experiencing a little compression. We're, using, we're not going to deal with that, but that's just an extra piece of information. We're looking at the max value KT is three. You guys got that? Okay. Let's say instead we have a hole and it has stresses that are the same. Sigma one equals sigma two. So the same value, say 100 KSI, 100 or 50 KSI in both directions. What's our stress concentration factor now? That's uh, two. Right? What if we have max and then exactly the same in compression? If this is this way and this is the other way, same value, but equal and opposite. That's the last case, number four. Or KT four. equals four. That, in, that introduces a, a state of shear that we're going to deal with later. And that gives us a max of 4.0. You see that? You got that? See how that works? Okay. All right. Applications. Let's say we have a cylinder. Have you guys worked with any cylindrical structures? Aircraft fuselage, rocket interstage. Let's say you have a rocket and you need to make a little hole in it because you need access, right? Bang. All you got to do is calculate what's the actual stress. It's just P over A. What's the A? 2 pi RT, right? P over A, except right there at the feature, right there at the feature, normally we would deal with the net stress, okay? In this case, we could either calculate this as the net stress or the far field stress, which would be the P over A without taking out the feature. Okay. All right. So we just go to this. Which case is this? Uniaxial. Uniaxial. Factor three. Okay. How about this? Let's say now you'll see we got another hole in a part, but now we have a finite width. In this case, we're calling the width capital D. That's not a diameter, that's a width. Okay. So in this case, you'll notice we have a central hole. What is our nominal stress? It's just the net stress. You can see that that's just the net stress. That's just the width minus the hole, right? So the, in this case, the net stress is the nominal stress and our stress concentration factor, we just plug and chug in this equation and our max stress is just KT stress nominal. Is that any different than KT times stress net? No, not in this case. Got it? That's a central hole. Let's see an application for this. Well, let's say we have a stringer like this. See this little Z stringer? What we can do is say, oh, look, we got a little stringer. Actually, if we flatten this part out, so if we say, okay, wait a minute. If you just imagine this rotates up and this rotates down so that our total part is this long, you see that? Then we just have a plate like that. You see that? Since it's just under axial load, what's the total length? Well, it's gonna be C, uh, let's see, let me get these dimensions cleared up here. I can't read my timing. This goes back to like the running load idea. Uh, let's see. if. If this is going to here, C, and this is going top to bottom, then actually our total length of this thing would be C minus T over two plus B minus T over two up here because we're going from center to center, right? B minus T over two minus T over two plus A minus T over two. That's the total length of this little thing, this plate that now looks like this with central hole. All that multiplied by the thickness, that's our net area. Our net stress is simply P over A net. And our max stress 
is just k sub t calculated from this equation times that f net, which in this case is also the same as f nominal. You guys got it? Yeah, Should I have I a question it? about that. So, but don't those um those bendings actually adjust like change like how that part like handles the stress like it it's like another feature right like so this actually is a central load and because of that our our net stress will be our net average will be here right and then what really is going to happen is peaking here like this oh i see but so like if the but if the force was on the other plane then you couldn't make that assumption right if the force was up here that would give us a bending also it'd be a different case or if our hole were say down here, that's going to give us a different case. Stay tuned. Got it? This is a central hole. True that? A common student mistake is using central hole where it should be an offset hole or vice versa. All right. So let's say we do have an offset hole like this. If that's the case, once again, we're going to call this big dimension D. We could have called it W. The trickiest part of it, now you'll notice here that our we're, we're no longer using the net stress. We're going to multiply kT times the nominal stress, and the nominal stress is this ugly equation. Why? Because, because this line of action is offset, you'll notice that the area here is no longer symmetric. It's offset. That's going to give you bending. We're not really ready to deal with bending yet. It's going to change the distribution, and this equation accounts for that. So what this nominal stress is, it's like the average, but after accounting for the offset load, and then we still have some peaking, that's why we need the stress concentration factor. You guys got it? So in this case, we'll use the nominal and then the stress concentration factor. Okay. Let's look at an example. For example, if we have this case, in the other case, we have that hole in the center. In this case, the hole is here. How do we figure out which case this is? Well, once again, you will fold this thing down. We're going to idealize this with a plate that's this long. And with a hole, it looks like it's located right at the middle of this, whatever this, right, not far down from here. You see that? And now what's this dimension? We'll call this L. It's not the length of the part, but it's the length of our little thing. It's actually this dimension from here to the center, plus here to the center here. Imagine right, right at the center of these two, that it folds out from there, and you're calculating what the total length is. And then you're going to figure out where this hole falls, how far down from the top it is. That's your C dimension. Once you have all that, central load, you've got your hole applied, you've got your total D, You've got your C dimension. You've got your radius of this thing. Another common area is use the diameter when you need radius and vice, vice versa. Calculate your nominal. Calculate your stress concentration factor. And plug and chug. If your stresses are below the yield, then that's probably a valid max. If this stress is below the yield, it's probably valid max. If this stress is above the yield, it's conservative and should be taken with a grain of salt. True that? You guys got it? All right, let's look at another one. Let's say we have multiple, does this ever happen in aircraft where you got a bunch of holes happening in the aircraft? It's all over the place, right? We got two cases here. Now look at them carefully. Look, they're different in another place where students tend to bugger this up. Got that one and that one. What's the difference? Uh, direction of the load. Exactly. See these holes like this? In the first case, the load is a, along the line of the of the uh, on the same is parallel to the line of the, the, the holes, and the second case is perpendicular to the line of the holes, and it responds differently. You see that? In this case, your load can spread around the whole line and only has to adjust a little bit as it goes down. In this case, it has to squeeze between each hole. It's diferente. So if our load is parallel to the line of holes, then we'll use this. And if it's perpendicular, we'll use this. Now, in both cases, the stress we're going to use 
is what's called the far field stress. It's the stress without removing the area of the fasteners. It's really common. Remember, we dealt with running loads. N, right? N is pounds per inch. It's very common to use that. If we know what the N is, then the stress is just N over T. That's the far field stress. Now we're going to take that stress and multiply by our K sub T from this equation. Got it? If our load is perpendicular to the line of action of the fasteners, we're going to again use the far field stress, which means we don't remove the area of the holes. We just take whatever the P over A is out here, and we're going to multiply it by KT from up there. This is called the far field stress because we have not accounted for the holes. Now, what is the difference between a far field stress and let's say this were not infinite. Let's say it's like five inches long. You would take five minus one, two, three, four, four times the diameter, all that times the thickness, that's your A net. You see that? But if you look for a case with multiple holes with a net area, you'll notice there is none in your handbook. Therefore, we're gonna pretend that is a infinite plate where you use the far field stress and multiply by KT. Same thing up here, got it? I mean, you guys are starting to feel like, yeah, we're going to get this stuff. It's a lot of little details to remember, but if you spend a little bit of time in here understanding where these cases are in your handbook, you guys should be able to solve this. Find your right table within about 20 seconds, 15 seconds. Sketch your problem, calculate your KT in about a minute or less. Calculate your stress in a minute or less. Multiply the max in seconds, box your answer seconds, and you're off to the next glorious problem. Comprende? Woohoo! Okay, multiple holes and infinite play. We got two cases. Let's take a look. Let's practice a little bit. Let's say we have this case. Let's say we have an aircraft. My pool guys here. Let's say we have an aircraft. It looks like this, and we pull out a little piece, and we got a line of action of fasteners like this. In this case, one eight or one nine. Uh, one eight. One nine. Well, that covers it, right? Which one? Who says one eight? One eight. Who says one nine? <laughs> we all agree. One eight parallel, parallel to the line of action. How about this guy? One nine. One nine. Perpendicular. Oh, nice. You might have been confused since there's two rows here, but you'll notice here these this loading is going right down this line of action, right down there. But in this case, it's actually on this one. It has to go through all these fasteners to go into some other splice number before it comes across. So this is clearly one nine, and this is clearly one eight. Got it? This is a semi-elliptic hole and an infinite. Now, the only difference here is we have an ellipse instead of a circular hole, okay? We're going to use the far field stress. You'll notice we could have, we could have both of them. We could have uniaxial, which means we just have one of them. We could have biaxial, which means we have both the same value. Or we can have biaxial where one is the negative of the other. It means one's in compression, the other's in tension. And these are the equations we're going to use. Got it? That would be if we had like an oblong hole in like an interstage or something. How about here? If we get it, this is a, just, this simulates the, uh, we used squarish doors like this in the Delta two, three, and four interstage cutouts with a little door that was bolted on, just like this. If you have a uniaxial load, You'll notice you have a radius of this box. It's not a perfect square. You've got your dimensions 2A and 2B, and you just plug and chug. One common thing is, look, this dimension is 2A, not A. So this is one half of that dimension, and B is one half of that dimension. You see that? Calculate your case of T. You multiply by the far field stress, which means you don't reduce, you don't increase the stress based on the change in cross section for that. That's a typical case for that guy. Let's say we have a dual notch. 
In this case, you can see our net area is going to be right through here, isn't it? It's just D minus 2H, right? And we'll see that this, what kind of stress is this? That is F net. It's hard to read in this slide. That's just F net or sigma net. That's just a minimum area. Now, in this case, you got to calculate all this crap. If your notch has these dimensions, you use these equations. If it has these dimensions, you use. Now, if you have something that's outside this or outside this, we're still going to use this because we have nothing better. So basically, you're looking at two. If it's less than or equal to two, you use this. And if it's more, you use that. And if it's outside the range, just put a warning. It might not be completely valid. Calculate your four constants, plug into here, and then multiply by your net stress. Make sense? Professor? Yes. Um, this uh, is a typo. You... This is a single notch, not a dual notch. Yes, what's the question? When you have an infinite sheet, is that when you use the, uh, the running... So we're not going to have a, a notch in an infinite sheet. Whenever we have a notch, we'll have a finite sheet. But um, is what is it called? The running stress? Oh, the like running overall? load? Yeah. So the running. The so running like, let's say we have that interstage. Let's say we, have, you know, the max thrust, that max thrust divided by your circumference times the thickness, right? Two pi RT is the area. P over that area or P over two pi R, that's your running load, pounds per inch around the thing. And you could just take that over T, that's your stress, that's the far field stress, and you apply that factor to it. Do we use the far field stress when, uh, for the cases that, like these shapes that have infinite, like an infinite sheet is where you when, use far field? Correct. Whenever there's okay. an infinite like sheet, you will use the far field number instead of trying to remove the, the feature. Okay. Now, let's say you have an actual rocket that's this big and you want to remove the feature as a more conservative and correct value, you could do that. But in our class, if we run into a semi-infinite sheet like that, we're going to go ahead and use the far field stress. Okay. okay, thank you. For simplicity. If we have a notch, we're going to use this stuff. You guys are getting good. You'll notice this is the net stress. And for this guy, once again, we will flatten this plate out and then we can pretend it's just a plate. It's like that wide with a notch. You guys see how that works now? You're starting to get good at this? And there's a supplementary video on this. If you didn't understand how to flatten that out, watch the supplementary video. It goes into this in detail. This is a dual notch where we basically have something that's narrow and it's getting thicker, okay? Now, this gets a little tricky. Students get confused about this because there's this H over R ratio, and they worry if they're outside the ratio. Uh, Basically, once again, we're going to use this two as the middle place. Anything below two, we're going to use this. Anything above two, we're going to use this. If we're outside of 20, we should be just put a flag that it's suspect. Below 0.1, it's suspect. And even though this has a criteria for what this length is, we're going to ignore that altogether. That's just telling us when this is more appropriate versus being less appropriate. Okay? So if we have a... Uh, I call this a dual shoulder. Actually, there's another typo. It's a dual shoulder under axial load. Okay. 